everyone, Devorah Esther here, and welcome to my channel. And if you are new here, please consider subscribing. This way you can be notified of all the upcoming Sherem and join in on the fun that we have in this channel. And speaking of fun, I'd like you to join in this mitzvah and share this lecture with someone. And my guest today is a best-selling author, speaker, executive coach who has lectured internationally on topics of Torah thought, Jewish medical ethics, psychology, and leadership. And his best-selling book, The Journey to Your Ultimate Self, serves as an inspiring gateway into a deeper Jewish thought. And he's also the founder and CEO of Self Mastery Academy, the transformative online self-development course based on principles and high performance on psychology and Torah. I'd like to welcome Rabbi Shmuel Reichman to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to have you on. Now, I actually, I got, you know, a PDF copy of this book and I got to tell you, I really, really love, first of all, I love the idea of Shabbos companions. And for like a lot of people, you know, there's a whole explosion in this channel. Everyone knows we've been exploring this topic of self, self-identity, um, because as you know, identity is, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of malleable. You're not the same person you were yesterday. You're not the same person you're going to, you know, tomorrow, you're not going to be the same person. And I feel like people in this generation, for whatever reason, are really struggling with identity and how to hone in on capturing that better version of themselves. It seems to be a really big problem. So I want you to tell us a little bit about what you do, what this book is about. I want to get into it. There's just so many, there were so many great tidbits in this book. Um, And if you're watching on YouTube, Bezrat Hashem, I'm going to have all the links down to the book, to his website. You really, really, really want to start connecting to this rabbi. You're really going to love uh, what he's all about. So please tell us what you're all about. Sure, sure. So I'd love to start by just saying that it's, it's, a, zuchut, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And when it comes to the world we live in, we live in the world of awareness, world of consciousness, world of ideas. And I feel like the world has become a place where there's access to everything, but a system for nothing. And everyone's looking. Very true. For clarity, right? They're looking for clarity. We, we live where you can start actually asking real questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose? And you're being thrown in a million different directions. And for people who are born in the Jewish tradition, they have access to Torah, but there's an infinite spectrum of Torah thought, meaning there's literal Torah Shabbat Shabbat. You can open Torah, you can open the Bible, you can go through the Talmud, you can go through Gemara. But when it comes to asking real questions, there's a whole Masora, a whole tradition of Jewish thought. And these ideas open you up to I, literally self-transformation. And you know, I've studied at Harvard, I studied at University of Chicago, Yeshiva University, I've studied many universities, but to truly transform yourself, you have to approach content, not from an academic perspective, but from an experiential transformative perspective, where you're trying to discover how the ideas you're learning will transform and shift how you see the world. And I, and I think that's important that you say that, because I think a lot of people get stuck in like reading, 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 I've learned, I've learned, I've learned, but they never put it into practice and it never, so it, it doesn't do anything. It, they just, they're like a car sitting in a garage. The wrong type of knowledge. <laughs> knowledge, which is about like, how can someone know that something's unhealthy and still eat it? How can you know that smoking will kill you and still do it? How can you know that, if, you know, saying nothing to your spouse is going to start a fight, but still do it? It's because we know from a point of intellect, but not from a deeper form of knowledge, which is how we live our lives. Like you need to breathe. Right? You need to eat. But until you get to the point where the type of ideas that you know, you have to live by them because it's so deep that not living by them is just walking outside of reality. But that's where skipping stops, right? You start with basically everyone, an ideal coaching, you know, teenagers, people in their 20s and people who have been living their life for 50 years and are extremely successful, but just, they still have the same questions. Like, what's my purpose? Why am I here? What am I doing in this world? I have no idea who I am. I know what I do for a living. I don't know who I am. And the entire premise of this book, it's meant to give people access to the deepest concepts and principles and ideas of Jewish thought in a very inspiring and accessible manner. So it's not a Parsha book. It's not a Torah portion book, but it's organized according to the Parsha to give people Almost like it's constructed into your yearly cycle of time 
Because if you open up a philosophy book or a book on Jewish mysticism and deeper Jewish thought, very often you put it back down because it's overwhelming. Yeah, it's you, something. Get, you get lost very quick. And, and, and sometimes it's like the idea of the esoteric, it seems like a very like, oh, let's get into that. But then when you start getting into it, you notice like I- I'm drowning you know exactly Exactly. and i i went through it myself because i was always looking like i've spent years and years studying the maharal and the ramchal and the tzaddik and the deepest jewish thinkers and it's the most incredible realm of conceptual metaphysical thought but i love it and i've spent years speaking and teaching it but a lot of people they're not inclined to venture into that realm of thought because it's too overwhelming it's too scary and also it's going to require them to change their lives and a lot of people they don't like learning that is a big key you know because people are like la, 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 la. i don't want to know because once i think that people realize that once they are aware of something then they're obligated yeah, it's like, don't tell right. me how many calories in that donut. I don't want to know. They just, you know. <laughs> and once you obligate them, there's almost like this anger because they feel like now it's like, how can, like you said, how can I smoke knowing what it does to me? And so there's this guilt trip that starts to come up and it's like yeah. a revolving cycle, you know? And, and the first thing is you want to change it from responsibility to opportunity and then from opportunity to responsibility because you have to realize number one living a life of truth is living the most extraordinary life ever i always tell people that the happiest people are people who aren't looking for happiness are looking for meaning when you start living a purpose-oriented life which is responsible right it means you have to watch what you do what you say what you think it means you have to start orienting yourself towards a higher form of living but then you start living the most extraordinary life and when you start giving up on ideals and principles and rules of morality and truth, you live a free life, but you're actually lost. And that's actually the, the beauty of Pesach, Passover, we're coming to the holiday of Passover. The classic question is we went from serving Pharaoh, serving power, to serving God. So we're still servants. But the most powerful line you can really live by is that only a slave to the truth is free, which means that when you commit yourself to the truth, you get the freedom to live a life of truth, to align yourself with a higher form of living. And just taking a step back, the entire book is basically premised on a very powerful passage of Gemara, a passage of Talmud. And the, Tal- the, the Talmud basically, it's in tractate in Masechet Nida, the Aflamin Mabez, 30b. And the Gemara says that when each of us were in the womb, we learned Kula Torah Kula. We learned all of Torah, all of Torah wisdom. And this angel, this Malach, after teaching us all of Torah, hits us on the mouth and makes us forget it. So everyone asks the same question, which is that, what's going on? What's the purpose? Right? If you're going to teach us all Torah, it's great. Why make us forget it? And if you're going to make us forget it, why teach it to us in the first place? Right. Well, everyone discusses this and try to figure out what's going on here, because it's such a deep, it's, it's basically it's the mythology of human evolution that you go through this metamorphosis in the womb, and then you lose it. So if this is our origin story, you'd think that, you know, it would be a little more inspiring at the end as opposed to just losing it. So the Vilna Gon shares the most incredible idea. He says that when you're learning Kola Torah Kula, it doesn't mean that you're learning just simple, revealed Torah. It means you're learning the metaphysics of existence itself. You're being shown the deepest elements of Torah. You're being shown the purpose of creation, the purpose of the world. But more importantly, you're being shown your unique purpose. You're being shown who you are designed to become. I mean, everything in this world, when it's fulfilling its purpose, is doing what it was created to do. And as human beings, we are self-aware. So we know that we have this yearning to do what we're supposed to do, but we don't know what it is we're designed to do. So the only one is saying that when you are in the womb, you're being shown what you are designed, what your blueprint is, what you're supposed to create, learn, what type of a vision is meant to be actualized in your journey in this world, And he says, and this is the most important thing, you didn't lose it. You didn't forget it. You lost access to it. And your journey, your entire life journey is coming into this world and becoming great, but not really becoming great, becoming you. Because greatness is becoming who you are designed to be. That means that you're not trying to be better than anyone else. It means you're not comparing yourself to other people. It means you are going through an eternal journey of self-awareness and self-exploration and bringing out your natural inborn potential. And that's what learning is. Learning is, it's like when you hear a really deep idea, sometimes you kind of feel like you're recognizing, like it just clicks. Like you have this aha moment, this flash, like, wow. Yes, yes. But why? 
right? If you're a blank slate, like John Locke was famous for saying, we're all blank slates, right? There's no metaphysical ideas out there. You never like, you're not tapping into truth. You're just being imprinted with knowledge. So then why do things click? Why do you have these aha moments? Why do you feel like you've learned this already? Or like you're recognizing something that you already- It's like deja vu. It's like deja vu. Exactly. exactly. <clears throat> and that's actually why the Vilna Gun says that sometimes you have deja vu because when you dream, your soul leaves the physical world. You're going back to that dimension and you're tapping into things beyond time. You come into this world, you have this feeling that somehow you experience things that already happened because you already- somehow did because you're tapped into a dimension beyond time and space, which is a really cool idea as well. But the idea here is that, you know, there's the, the platonic principle of ideas is that there are metaphysical truths in the ether, like in the, the matter universe. And when you learn, you're actually tapping into something that's objectively true. So we're not going to get into how that relates to, to the deeper Jewish thought because it's related. It's different, but it's related. But the concept is that you're literally, when you're learning, you're tapping into an aspect of yourself that's already there. So you basically, it's like the Michelangelo quote that, that we talked about before. Yes, yes. And I really, I do want to, when you're done, I want to share that. that you can quote. share it now because it relates exactly. Yeah, it really is. A, let me just pull it up because this really was wonderful. And you'll find this in the voracious portion of the book. And it literally says, Michelangelo once asked, how is it that you create such wondrous sculptures and works of art? How can something so innovative and ingenious emanate from mere mortal hands? Without skipping a beat, Michelangelo responded, before I even began my work, the sculpture is already complete within the marble block. My job is simply to discover it and then chisel away the superfluous material. The dormant potential already exists beneath the surface. The job of the artist is simply to discover that which is hidden within, then transforms the concealed into the revealed. And I thought that was you know, I mean, did, I think Hashem put that in his mouth because that was just like. <sighs> but that's the most powerful way to live your life is to say that I'm not trying to get a good job, become successful, be happy, get married, make money, um, figure out what I'm supposed to be doing so that I can make some meaning out of this crazy life we live in. I'm trying to figure out who I am and not to create my personality but to reveal it and not you know, I to... had an interview with a, another rabbi um and it was called Ani Alami he was he was yeah. part of Alami the, the organization yeah of course and, and I said I literally said you know my journey has always been transforming three words who am I into who I am mm. and it's always this constant of you know you have this question about where you're holding in life and I always feel like at that moment, it's my job to discover this is the answer. This is who I am. And I think that a lot of people, they go through this. I mean, the question of who am I is a huge, I don't know anyone. I don't think I've ever met anyone who has not gone through this or who is still not going through this. And there's times I even say to Hashem, I think I know what my purpose is. Am I doing it? And sometimes I feel like, I know that I'm doing it because I have the most joy in my life when I'm doing it, which is always connecting to Klai Israel, connecting to the world and bringing the light of Torah into the world. That's my passion. That's what I love. And whatever way that Hashem allows me to do it, that's when I'm at my zenith, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that most people just cannot tap no matter how hard they can't tap into that. So I'll, I'll share something that I have ne I've never actually shared this in public. And it, it's a very, it's, it's a profound thought, but in general, and I've been in this, let's call it this industry for, for a long time, right? The self-development, high performance, philosophy, living your purpose. I'm in many different worlds, but among the worlds that I'm in, that's one of the main ones. And it's almost always the same breakdown where you have people who are sharing on the platform or on, you know, in the book or in public, you know, living your purpose, living your passion, it always kind of turns into the people who are living their purpose are the ones who are inspiring others to live their purpose. And everyone else is confused saying, how can I live my purpose? And it's almost like this breakdown of, you know, the simple people living their normal jobs and the people who are inspiring others to live their purpose, who are living their purpose as inspiring you to live their purpose. And it seems a little strange that the only people living their purpose are the ones that are telling you to live your purpose, because is <laughs> that, that the only way to live your purpose is to inspire us to live your purpose? So, I, I will say on two fronts. Number one, 
living your purpose is just being self-aware and actualizing all of your inborn talents and discovering which skills you can add to what is, so to speak, naturally gifted to you so that you can contribute to the world in the most meaningful way based on your ongoing pursuit of truth and contributing towards the, you know, as the Jewish people towards the Jewish people and helping everyone in the Jewish world grow and thrive and blossom and as the world as a whole to really contribute your talents to the world. Not being on the front lines, not being a public speaker, not being the one who seems to be the passion inspired one telling you to be inspired and passionate because then it's just a very strange catch 22 where to live your purpose means to inspire others to live your purpose, but then that means everyone not doing that is not living their purpose. And that's a very strange way to live your purpose to help others live their purpose. So that's part of it. It's, it's one. Also, a lot of people who are the speakers, the writers, the educators, the ones who are on the front lines, they discovered their love and passion for educating and helping and teaching when they were young. And they devote their life to that. And they started, the ones who you are seeing are the ones who are usually the, success, the successful ones. But as an executive and a high performance coach, one of the things I do is I take people who are already doing good and I help them become great. Because, you know, I'm, I'm pretty young and I never, ever, ever stop pushing and never stop questioning and realigning because when you think you've discovered your purpose and you live the rest of your life thoughtlessly living that purpose, you're not living your purpose. You're living out the purpose that you designed and discovered when you were inspired at a certain stage in your life to ask yourself, what's your purpose? But your purpose is endlessly evolving because you should be endlessly evolving, which means that your impact and your learning schedule and your work ethic and your philosophy and your ideals and what you think you're capable of and what you expect of yourself should always be expanding. And I've seen so many world leaders world-class leaders, people who are doing incredible things, they just stopped asking more of themselves. They just stayed doing what other people consider to be great, even though on their own standard, it's easy now. Like they're not really pushing. And when you start building muscle, you have to rip apart the muscle. But if there's no resistance anymore and you're lifting the weights easily, it means that you're no longer lifting weights, right? You're not exercising, you're maintaining Right. And the goal of life is not to maintain. So one of the biggest problems I've seen is that we think it's about great leaders and everyone else, but great leaders are still just people. And they might be great leaders to everyone who's looking up to them, but for themselves, between them and Hashem, them and God, they're still just at a very primitive stage of their own story. And the, the analogy I like to use is that life is like walking blindfolded on the edge of a cliff. And when you're walking blindfolded on the edge of a cliff, you walk very slowly, but you continue to push forward, right? Because let's say your goal is to move forward. Let's assume that's the premise. So this is a very interesting cliff because what happens is that in life, let's say you're pushing, right? You're saying, what am I capable of? So you start inching towards the edge of the cliff and you're you're learning, you're feeding your mind, you're feeding your emotional health, you're working out, you're exercising, you're building great relationships, you're devoting your life to improving your career, and you're improving your relationship with Hashem, and you're, you're growing. And that's you, you pushing to see what you're capable of. You're pushing to the edge of the cliff. But then you might get to the edge of the cliff, your toes might get to the edge, and you're like, whoa, this is it. This is the edge. So you push back a tiny bit, you don't want to fall off. Right. And then you basically say, This is where I am. This is who I am. This is my mission. This is my purpose. You start growing. But at a certain point, you start realizing this is a very strange cliff. The cliff moves every once in a while, stretches. So every once in a while, I'm not saying every 10 minutes, because then you can't really love your life. Because every time you commit yourself to a certain <laughs> lifestyle, if you question it and say, Where am I? You're not going to get far. And a lot of people, they struggle because they either they don't like evaluating themselves, it's too stressful or they're always evaluating themselves and they, they kind of stagnate and they paralyze their growth because they're always, they're hyper self-aware. So because you're a hyper self-aware, you don't get outside your head. You're always undermining yourself. I have somebody in my office who's like this. And I always say, it's like, you're afraid to get off the sidewalk and walk into your life. It's exactly. like, you're just always afraid. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, it, <laughs> It's just amazing. I don't know how they function in life. I mean, they just, they don't move. They're paralyzed. Yeah. I mean, there, we can talk about paralysis in, in a second because there, there's so many causes, but just to finish the analogy, a lot of people who you see as your role models in life are actually not moving, right? They've kind of, they kind of like put down their flag and said, this is my camp. And the greatest of all time, like Moshe Rabbeinu, never stopped growing. 
right? Never stop growth. If someone, like after you receive the Torah, someone you know, questions him and he goes back and, and questions whether or not that person who questioned him, maybe he has an aspect of truth in that. It's someone who's always reflecting, always trying to grow, but the, the beauty and the balance of life is building balance in life which is when you can say, I want to always, always be striving, and yet I'm going to be willing to take steps back. That's really what Shabbos is all about. Shabbos is, it's a cessation of the growth process. Right? And Shabbos, it's really about stopping physical activity. So we don't do malacha, but malacha isn't just physical activity. It comes from the shosh of malach, which is a creative emanation from Hashem. An angel is a creative emanation from Hashem. Malacha is creative activity. So all the malachas that Hashem used to create the world, that we used to create the Mishkan, we don't do that on Shabbos. Why? Because Shabbos is about stopping the process where the Gemara and Brachos, uh, Masech that talks about blessings, Gemara and Brachos, Daphne and Zion, says that Shabbos is me'in olam haba. It's a taste of the world to come. Why? Because in the world to come, you stop the ability to create yourself and you experience everything you built. You experience the person, the shama, the consciousness, the self that you crafted and built. On Shabbos, you stop to a certain extent your activity in the world and you get to experience who you are. It's a reflective, powerful, powerful time of, of your life if you take advantage of it. But it's also an ability to recalibrate. And say, okay, this is this is what I've accomplished this past week. This is also what I've accomplished so far in my life. This is what I'm going to do this week. This is what I'm going to shift a little bit. This is how I'm going to take my life to the next level. And then you turn your life into a story, into a project, which is amazing. But there are people who get paralyzed by fear. Right? Fear of failure. What if I try and I don't succeed? Fear of what other people will think of them. What if That's I start you. raising my values and my family, my friends, my teachers, what if they don't understand? What if they, so many times, I, I can't tell you what, what changed my life and what changes people's lives when they start realizing that no one's ever going to understand your dreams. No one, That's no one true. will ever. <laughs> and the reason why because they weren't given to them. They were given to you. Hashem gave you your dreams. So if you're telling someone who's devoted their entire life to becoming a math teacher that I want to become an artist, they're going to be like, no, 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 you, should, you shouldn't do that. That's like, because they don't understand what it means to have your dream. And just take the analogy in anything in life. If you're trying to, that's why I always say, be very careful who you share your dreams with. Because if you share with the wrong person at the wrong stage, they'll crush it and they'll crush you and you'll give up on them. Right? A lot of critical, practical, rational-oriented people, they don't understand the idea of getting outside your comfort zone and taking the calculated risk of striving, even though you're not destined to automatically succeed. Someone who has never taken any risk in life, always worked with what they're good at and always taken the safe path, they're not happy and they don't want other people to do it. So if they're your parent or they're your spouse or they're your friend, they will not let you take that path, or at least they'll advise you not to simply because they don't understand it. And they're not conscious of the fact that they might also not want you to succeed. Because if well, you think, succeed, I think what you just said, I think there's going to be a lot of people that that just like that statement right there just really blew them because you're exactly right. And I think that people get caught up on what other people's opinion of them. And I always say like, I gave up on that a long time ago because people don't ask me permission to go do what they want to do and they could care less what I have to think about it. So why should I care what you have to think about it? Let me do me and you do you. <laughs> a lot of people, they get their self-worth or at least they think they get their self-worth from what other people think of them. So there's the circular philosophy that people have, which is that I don't know who I am. I don't really like myself, but I want other people to like me. And the reason I want other people to like me is because I woke up to this world not knowing what to do. Like, what is it? Like, what's the, like, no, there's no real, um, like, instruction manual for, I mean, there is the Torah, but not many people. Don't I say the same thing. We so, did that manual. <laughs> so, so people kind of don't really know what the instruction manual is to happiness or to living a great life. So they look at other people and say, like, uh, maybe someone else has an idea what's going on. So they then say, if I align myself with other people enough and I get enough external validation and people say, yes, what you're doing, that's good. That, that's, that's correct. That's right. And I do that enough that everything I eat, everything I talk about, everything I think about, how I dress, how I live my life reflects other people's, what they're expecting or wanting of me. 
then I'm hoping that I'll be happy, right? Because if they like me, I'll like me. If they approve of me, I'll approve of me. And what happens is that those people are as fake as can be, not because they want to be, because they, they were never taught differently. And they don't have an original thought for the life of them because they've never learned how to think. They don't have an opinion because they've never really sat down and tried to build themselves, devoting themselves towards discovering who they are and finding their unique purpose in life. So how they can contribute something significant and meaningful to the lives of others. And it's one of those things where the paradox at the center of this is that no one likes people who are fake, right? No one likes people who aren't genuine. So in the hopes of having people like us, we stop trying to discover who we are and we become who we think they think, who, who, what we think they think is important or what we think they want us to be. We don't end up becoming our true selves. We end up becoming a, a, a mirror, but really not a mirror, but more of a shadow of someone else. And then we live our lives in regret and we don't like ourselves. They don't like us. And we just end up hopeless. So and if you end up at the end off, of your life wishing you would have done it all differently. Exactly. And, and one of the, like we talked a little bit before, before this, uh, this conversation, we talked a little about having a near death experience and Correct. how that can be life changing. So what I, what I did at an earlier stage of my life is I started sharing my near-death experience. I'm not going to go into it now. It's a whole story. But when I was younger, I basically had a, a three, four-month period of my life where I was losing consciousness every single day. And every single time I had to fight to come back. When you pass out, you wake up. But this was different. I had to fight to come back to consciousness. And every single day, I thought I was going to die. Every single day, this was happening on a weekly basis for months. And I, I really thought I was going to die. And I just cry out to Hashem and say, why is this happening to me? Like, why? I'm not trying to kill anybody. I'm not a bad person. I'm just trying to live my life. Why are you doing this to me? Right. But I also was given the gift of waking up and saying, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be in this world. I might as well take advantage of whatever time I do have left. And that's really the start of my story. I started seeking out mentors and teachers. I started reading everything I can get my hands. I started learning, seeking out the grace of Rebbeim. And I got smicha that I went to get. I got my BA and I got my master's education, master's in Jewish studies, studied at Harvard, studied at University of Chicago. I got, you know, coaching certification from Tony Robbins and tried to, you know, just publish my first book. And you look at all of this output, you say, where does it come from? Like, why, why was I so motivated? And the answer is I just never lost that drive to make something of the time I have left. And a lot of people, they hear that story. And the question I used to get is like, oh, so like I have to wait till a near-death experience to start living my life. Great. Like, where is it, Hashem? Just send it to me. And I, I said, like, no, <laughs> no. Well, that's you, for sure that should be what sure it takes. <laughs> but my goal became the exact opposite, is to simulate the awareness level that you have when you start realizing how much of a gift every single day is and how... Correct. Like, why do we love organ donors? We love organ donors because they save someone's life. The person was going to die unless they gave a, a kidney. Uh, and I can't really give a heart. So you don't really thank the organ donor for giving a heart. But uh, I mean, you do post uh, uh, posthumously without getting into a lachic discussion. It's a very interesting topic. But why do you think an organ donor? They gave someone life. Well, every single day, Hashem gives you everything you have. Right, your eyes, your ability to breathe, your ability to think, your ability to pursue and to have goals and to have relationships, like your entire life is a gift. And when you start saying, what's the purpose of that gift? What am I doing with my life? You start being able to simulate the near-death experience of losing all that and saying, wow, like maybe I should value everything. And do something with my time. <laughs> and do something with my time. It's it's like the the classic the classic paradigm is if you were given eighty six thousand four hundred dollars every single day, and at the end of the day, whatever you didn't spend, you would lose. So your bank account gets eighty six thousand four hundred dollars every single day. How much would you spend of that? And well, I'll tell you, my husband will tell you all of it in ten minutes flat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ten minutes flat, you get twenty. Well, I have no problem with that. But you're right, you know, and, and I and I and I sent you a, a video and, and it was called The Last Gilgul. And, and it was mm -hmm. almost after this, la you know, this near death, because it's true. What would you do? How would you live your life differently today if you knew there was not going to be a tomorrow? And if you are on a spiritual level and you know the, the, the idea of the Gilgul and all that, what if you knew that there was not going to be another Gilgul? This is it. This is your last chance to get it right. What would you do differently? Exactly. And, and the end of that analogy is that every single day you're given 86,400 seconds. 
right? That's how many seconds are in 24 hours. And whatever you don't spend, you don't get back. So if you'd spend all $86,400, if you were given that every single day, how much more so time, which is infinitely valuable. And it's also, th that, that's one of the, the greatest conflicts of life is that you have two, by the way, all, all thought, if you want to live a thought out life, a balanced life, a really passionate driven life, you have to learn how to balance contradictory principles. So a lot of people, they don't like contradiction. So they either ignore the contradiction or they try to ignore one of the contradictory principles. So if you want to live a great life, it's about balancing and creating synergy, synthesizing contradicting principles. That's the, in deeper truth, that's chesed and tefares, where you learn how to create something beautiful out of what seems to be conflict. So shalom is not the lack of conflict. Shalom means peace. Shalom is not the lack of conflict. It's creating something extraordinary out of conflict. So when you have one principle that says, live your life as if there's no tomorrow. Live your life as if today is the last day, as if every day is a gift and you don't know if Hashem's going to give you the today. That's it. Not even today, right now. And then you have another principle which says, make your life meaningful, create long-term goals, have a vision, have a destination, commit to learning all of the time. We see these contradictions, right. So, what in the world is someone supposed to take with those two principles? So I, I always hear people saying it's all about living in the moment. Then I hear people who are, it's all about having long-term goals, having a clear destination, creating focus. If you don't know where you're going in life, you're not going to go anywhere. Unless you know what your destination is, unless you have clear goals, you can't accomplish anything. So which is it? And the answer is that you have to have both. Meaning what? Meaning that number one, create a clear path. Number two, live fully in the present, heading towards that path. And number three, every now and then reassess your path, reassess your goals and destination. Because your present moment is defined based on your memory, as in who you think you are. And usually you wake up in the morning and you attach an identity to yourself based on yesterday. And that's actually the idea of Avraham. Avraham we know that Avraham says, Anochi Afer Ve'ether. I am but dust and ashes. So the classic translation of Avraham Afer is I am dust and ashes, and we think of it as being humble. Avraham Abraham was being humble. But the deeper translation of this idea is that Afraham Afer also means what's, what, what's, what's ash? Ash is to break something into its elemental form. Right? When you ash something, you break it down into its literal elemental components. And dirt is where you plant something anew. So Avram saying, I know I constantly break myself down and replant myself anew. I never continue living who I am based on just who I was yesterday. I don't just continue the same self, the same identity, the same paradigms and perceptions, the same philosophy. I'm always redeveloping. I'm always harnessing. I'm always kind of recalibrating and taking things to the next level. And I think that's important, that recalibration, because I think people, they a lot of times they hear, make a goal for your life, do this, and then they get stuck on that goal. And it's like the 40-year, five-year plan, right? Yeah, and, and, exactly. and, they're, and they're just like, it has to work. It has to work. I plan this out. It has to work. And I think people get caught in this trap as well, you know? 100%. 100%. And that's why... It's like you want to be flexible, but you don't want to be too flexible. You want to be rigid. You don't want to be too rigid. It's it's always this dance in life. It's like the three We're bears. Like, Remember the story of the three bears? Yeah. This one's too hot. This one's just cold. This one's just right. It's like you always got to get, you got to bring that balance. And that's kind of like the Sephiro. You have to bring everything into that balance. You know, you can't go too much to Gevora. You can't get too much to Chesed. You have to go right into the middle of it. You know, it's and it's a, it, it's like you said, it's a dance. 100%. And I think one of the mistakes people do make is I think that balance means middle. Balance does not mean middle. Balance means balance. So it could be that for some people or at certain stages in your life, you need to be very much towards one side of the spectrum. But as long as you're on the spectrum, it's like, why is the world so... Why is there so much animosity towards other people's perspectives? Right? We live in a world of a lot of... like animosity and conflict and argument. And if you have an opinion different than mine, you're evil or, or you're, you're really, really, you make me angry. Like, why does that make you angry? It's because we live in a world where there's one answer to every question.
It's the answer. And there's no other answer. And as long as you think you have the answer, if another person has an answer, then they're undermining your truth. And if they're undermining your truth, they're undermining you and they're attacking you, or they're at least making you feel uncomfortable about your perspective. So in the world of politics, in the world of basically every dimension of life, we we lack the ability to truly admire and respect the spectrum of truth. That's the, the deep spiritual concept of Elu Ve'elu Divri Elukim Chaim. And in the realm of Torah, there can be multiple approaches. Why? Because it's, it's like, I'll give you just an example. A uh, kid comes to his father and he says, you know, David punched me in the face. So David punched me in the face, goes over, David, David you punched Chaim in the face. You punched my son in the face. And so David says, yeah, because Chaim pushed me down the stairs. Chaim, you pushed David down the stairs? And then he says, yeah, because he tripped me. You tripped him, yeah, because you called him, he, you, he called me a name. So all of a sudden you're like, okay, what is, like, I thought that this kid, you know, beat up my right, son. Right, right. But I only had a small piece. And the question is, who's, who's right? Are they both right or neither of them right? The answer is that they make up parts of the fuller story. And a lot of people in this world, without getting into the metaphysics of like a higher dimension and express dimension, but when you take white light, and you put it through a prism, it gets, you get the full spectrum of the rainbow, right? So if someone were to say that white light is orange, are they, are they right? What about the other person says that white light is blue? Is that person right? The answer is that they're both right and they're both wrong because they only have a piece of the fuller picture. Yeah. When you start to, instead of like, it's when you learn any sugi in Torah, any topic in Torah thought, you're always going to have different opinions, different posts and different Jewish authorities will have an approach. Now, which one's right? So we have this principle, Eliv, Elu, Divri, Elu, Kim Chaim. They're all right. Well, how are they all right? Because the way that truth works in the physical world is that it's that white light expressed through the prism where there's multiple colors. There are all aspects of the truth, but the actual truth is greater than any of the sum of their parts. And it's greater than any of those individual shards of truth. So when you have... When you have a really important debate over really important issues and you have two opposing signs, number one, you usually will have, you know, more than just two simple approaches. You usually have three, four, five possible approaches. Number two is that they usually all reflect some important principle, but they don't contain the whole truth. And what each of these sides will do is they'll pretend to be the whole truth. And they'll say, we are the only truth. And the other person will say, we're the only truth. The actual greatest truth would be taking the best of both of them. But in a world of simplicity and kind of trying to create extreme, you know, simple truths, those two sides won't create something harmonious where they come together and create something greater. They'll create actually more friction and they'll isolate themselves. And they'll say, you're evil, you're wrong, you're a lie. And you see this in politics, you see this in relationships. I was going to say, can we get you out on the world stage right now? Because America's really like burning to the core over these kind of issues right now. You know, this, this, this is what we're seeing right now is really just a reflection of human history. This is the, uh, you know, philosopher kings, the concept of having someone who's brilliant in power. And the reason why it doesn't work is because brilliance is not viral. Brilliance is difficult. It takes patience. It takes commitment to working through the nuance. And the people who you choose as your leaders are the people who are, you know, full of passion and excitement and will say the things that you already want to hear. There's a deep Jewish principle that leaders don't lead the people, they lead the people towards the truth. And in the world of democracy, the leader is nothing other than a reflection or puppet of the people, right? The people vote. But in the world of truth, a leader reflects something higher than himself or herself, reflects Hashem, and leads the people towards Hashem. So that's a very different brand, a very different model of leadership. And in the world of modern politics, it's very difficult because the whole party system is based off of taking certain values, certain principles of truth, and isolating them as the only truth. So liberal and conservative principles make the spectrum of truth, people who try to conserve traditional ideas, people who are always trying to push boundaries and create novel, new um, 
you know, staying with the times and trying to take things to the next level, pushing past boundaries, breaking down old walls. When you can balance and harmonize those two, you get something incredible, but it also requires a commitment towards nuance, towards qualifying very simple things. And it's not, it's not yet, I mean, that's, you know, hopefully the, the Zaman of Mashiach, that's the whole purpose, is revealing truth to the world. But until then, you have people heading towards it. So the world's definitely becoming more enlightened. Torah is becoming much more viral. Uh, deeper ideas, if you, you know, even, even the podcast world and the non-Jewish world, people say like, oh, everyone's getting dumb. Everyone has no patience, needs 60 second bursts of fluffy inspiration. That's all people can handle anymore. It's not true. People listen to two, three hour conversations of highly intellectual, sophisticated, brilliant discussions of analytical and, and post-rational minds where you have you know, the greatest thinkers in the non-Jewish world sitting down and talking in dialogue with each other. That's, that's incredible. You get, they, these videos get millions of views. Why? Because people want it. People want nuance. They want brilliance. They don't want to be talked down to. They don't want to be talked as if they're dumb. I think they this don't. is so important because I've had this, uh, I, I wouldn't say a fight, but I've had this discussion with a lot of rabbis who, like you said, they only want to give a lot of the inspiration, but I think that people really can handle the socket to me truth. 100%. And I think that they're looking for that. And I think that's part of the problem why so many people are lost because they all they're getting is these feel good quotes that that are fleeting. They they don't last. Inspiration is is it's a, it's a moment it's a momentary thing, and they're looking for that socket to me truth. Like, Harav, my life is falling apart. I don't need an inspirational quote. I need a how to to get out of this. Exactly, exactly. Like everyone can be inspired by a great story or by a great, you know, you can be anything you want to be. Like, right, right, right. Okay, now how do I do it? Okay, so here's what you do. You have to do a lot of uncomfortable things, get outside your comfort zone. You have to commit to the right environment. You have to rebuild your mind, rewire your neural synapses. And you have to get so rid of the people who are holding you back. They're so afraid yeah. to say that. Because no one, well, well, here's the thing. It's, it's more than just that. It's also to be a great orator, to be a great speaker, you have to commit. It's an art. It's truly an art to be able to passionately and articulately express ideas. The greatest, greatest inspirational speakers are usually, um, they're just airheads, right? They usually have nothing of substance to say. And the greatest <laughs> intellectuals have zero speaking skills. Right, they they literally speak in monotone. They don't know how to formulate. They don't know how to organize. They don't know how to instill a will in the listener, so that the person actually wants to live these ideas. They just have spent their life in books, and they now share the information they've learned. I, from a very young age, was that was my biggest pet peeve. I looked at the greatest speakers in the Jewish world, in the non-Jewish world, in the Tony Robbins and Les Browns, and you know, the the greatest speakers and the inspirational speakers in the Jewish world. And I said, what if? Like the greatest Gedoli Hador and Talmidi Chachamim and intellectuals and philosophers learned how to speak that way. Like what if they could instill such a will, but actually speak about substance and give, uh, you know, a lot of lectures, they, they spend an hour saying what could have been said in 30 seconds. True, you know, so true. Story there, story there. Oh, it reminds me of this. And I did that. And oh, you should be a good person. But by the way, it reminds me of this. And it's like, what did you actually learn? I was inspired. I loved it. It was a great dinner speech. Right, right. Dinner. Now, and then now you go, what? <laughs> Then you go to these lectures that could be literally 12 hours of content crystallized into an hour-long, brilliant lecture. Those are rare to begin with, and usually people who share them, you have to go through an agonizing process of listening to a very uninspiring lecture. What if that didn't have to be so? What if the content could be brilliantly expressed through the medium of passion and inspiration, utilizing stories, but kind of giving a coding to content with stories as opposed to saying stories and then figuring out how to also give a, a nice takeaway message at the end. When you can say that, number one, Torah wisdom and wisdom in general, it's up here, it's not down here. And number two, what I, I, the fact that I'm speaking like this means that I think you are able to come to this level, you speak up to your audience as opposed to down. You say that I am expecting the best out of you as opposed to coming down to your level and trying to entertain you. You know, entertainment is great, but what's the purpose? Is it the education or the entertainment? The goal should be the education. Entertainment is an escape. It makes things, you know, you forget your problems, but entertainment can also be a tool. 
you can utilize it to bring people into the realm of thought. And when people start thinking and they start realizing that I can fall in love with growth, I can fall in love with wisdom. And it's not like I have to give up who I am to live a life of truth, but I can finally discover who I am by living a life of truth. Everything changes and you don't have to kind of be dragged into the learning process, but you're literally trying to find out how you can free up more time so you can learn more. And it's addictive. It's the greatest form of addiction because addiction means you can't live without it. And everyone has their negative addictions in life. It's literally the, the, the fundamental component of being a human being is we create loops within ourselves that we just fall into the bad recycling habits where we think the same thoughts, eat the same food, do the same things, have the same conversations. When you learn how to, number one, break your bad cycles, and number two, create good cycles, right? You daven, people who daven three times a day, you daven every day, right? There are people who literally will do that from the time that they're a child till the time that they leave this world. That's a great cycle. The fallacy or the greatest potential problem of a cycle is that you fall into a good cycle, but it turns mindless. So you do it habitually and it's not meaningful. It's not, there's no spontaneity. There's no thoughtfulness. There's no concentration. So then you want to reintroduce novelty and creativity into the good cycles. So you're praying, you're davening, but now I'm davening with intention and mindfulness, right? I'm doing mitzvahs. I'm serving Hashem, but I'm doing it with intention and depth. I'm learning Torah, but I'm doing it for not the sake of like Hashem wants me to learn Torah, so I'm learning Torah, but I'm learning Torah to live Torah. I'm trying to recreate my paradigms and my perceptions and try to figure out how to live a life of truth, not just learn a life of truth. Right? Torah is not an academic pursuit. So let me a- ask you, do you find that it's harder to inspire a from from birth or a balei tshuva? Oh, from from birth, 100%. Yeah, because I, I think like Bali Chuva, that's what they're doing all the time. They're reinventing exactly. themselves, they're they're breaking their patterns, their thoughts, where it's like when you're fruit from birth, this is what we do, this is what we always do. Tati did it, you know, Zadie did it. So it's it's like it's it's the rote learning after a while. Exactly, exactly. People who are from from birth, the greatest tragedy of being from from birth is that from a very young age, you think you know. And when you think you know, you can't learn because learning requires the understanding that you don't yet understand, the knowledge that you don't know. It means that there is the destination and you're here, right? Meaning the destination, let's put it off screen. You don't even know where the destination is, right? It's off the screen. You're, you're searching for it, but you're not there yet. From, from birth, it's like, this is destination. This is me, right? Okay. Chuva, they, they wake up. They wake up in life and they're like, I want to learn. I want to know. I want to grow. I want to ask every question. I don't know anything. I literally, the the respect that they have for for Rebbe and for for their teachers is incredible because they literally think that their teachers are opening up their mind and taking them towards the truth. For people who are from from birth, a lot of them, they don't think of Torah as the purpose of Torah is to completely transform the way you see the world, yourself, Hashem, the Jewish people, meaning life, everything. And it's an endless pursuit towards that. They think that learning Torah is something Hashem wants you to do and you just do it to be Mekhaim, check, you know, check the learning Torah box and go back to your day, make money. Right, you know, shock check, right? Exactly. So when you can, one of the things that I, you know, first of all, Bali Tshuva, the idea of Tshuva is return, right? Tshuva means Shuv, return. And a lot of the Bali Mashiach say that the idea of Tshuva is returning to what? Returning to, like I just mentioned earlier, that Gemara Nida, to your fetal self, yourself from the womb, who was at that ideal stage, meaning you're, we're all returning to who, we sp- who we're supposed to be. Bali Tshuva, they just woke up in the middle of their lives and started that journey. But people who are from, from birth, they never realized that that's what the journey was supposed to be. So I think we're all Bali Tshuva. We're all returning to who we're supposed to be. The only question is, are you aware of that? And then once you are, well, one of my underlying goals is to completely change the way that people who are from from birth approach Torah. Because once you start acting like a Balchuva, even though you're from from birth, you start loving Torah. You start loving Hashem. You start loving life because you're not just going through the motions. You're not just checking things off. You are, you're like, 
constantly internally evolving and your connection with yourself, with your spouse, with your children, with your friends, with Hashem, with the Jewish people, with the world, everything is endlessly growing because you go into a shir saying, I don't want to come out the same way I came in. I'm learning for the sake of figuring out how to live my life as opposed to so I can feel good about myself right. and say that I am fulfilling the rats in Hashem. Hashem doesn't want you to learn Torah so he can kind of say like, wow, that's great that you're learning Torah. The purpose of Torah is a gateway towards you living your purpose and your ultimate, ultimate self, which is, by the way, the entire goal of the book that I wrote was, I mean, this is for people essentially of all spectrums. I mean, most of the people are going to read are people who are from, from birth, right? The Askamas are from the Gedolim of the, the from Jewish world, uh, Rev. Asher Weiss, Rev. Kiva Taretz, Rev. Rosenzweig, uh, Jonathan, La- uh, Jonathan, Rev. Jonathan Rietti, Rev. Leff, Rev. Leff. But I've had people who are from, from birth, who are who have converted, who are Bali Tshuva, all of them, the same exact response that this is changing my life. Because the entire purpose of the book is to take you from a surface level or even a somewhat deep level of approaching Torah and mitzvahs and Avodah Hashem and going to the core fundamental ideas, the paradigm shifts that will revolutionize how you see yourself, how you live your life, how you think, will give such tremendous depth and meaning to everything in Judaism, and also create an extremely inspiring and enjoyable process so that Torah learning becomes something addictive, right? A good cycle that you cannot but tap into because it becomes literally your haven in this world where you tap into a realm of thought and ideas, which by the way, gets back to standards, helping people raise their standards as opposed to speaking down to them and saying like, oh, like I know life's tough. It's okay. Like when you sympathize, sympathizing with someone who's not in the stage of life they want to be in doesn't help them. Because what it does is basically, if you tell someone, let's say someone's like somewhat of an atheist, right? They've just gone through tremendous struggle and they, they hate God, they hate themselves, they hate life. And you say, it's okay. It's okay. I know it's tough, but like, you know, you're perfect the way you are. Everything's good. Yeah, what are you telling them? Service. Such what a service you to the people. You're right. literally telling them that this is as high as it gets in life. This is it, you know, but it's okay, you know. You, you, it's you, you. What can you do? <laughs> if you give them a vision of a better future, give them hope and belief in themselves and start, you know, pushing them to raise up to who they know they could be. Like that's the greatest gift you can give to someone is giving them a belief that they don't yet have in themselves. Right? And very often, no one, very, very often it's the opposite. It's that you have to believe in yourself because no one else will. Right, right. It's like, it would be great if, if everyone who had a dream, people would be like, you have a dream? Good for you. Let me do everything I can to help you. Like, oh my gosh, he has a dream. Hey, come here, come here. Like, let's help him. Did you hear? Did you hear? Like, he's yeah. got a dream. A million dollars? Here you go. And oh, what was that you want? Oh yeah, we'll give you a million followers and we'll help you start your business and we'll give you everything. Like that never happens. And the reason why is because no one cares like it's just <laughs> so true. it's just it's just the way it is everyone has their own problems it would be great if there was a surplus yeah, of that's people that's who are already perfect so but it's just not how the way the world works and if you don't have the resources to get you know people to pay people to be interested in you and to help you it's just not going to happen so what you need to do is you need to start believing in yourself you need to start building right. the self-confidence and the identity and for Everyone who has achieved an element of their dream, yes, there is something called chesed, which is doing something kind and helping someone who's not yet, you know, look at people, that's the greatest people in the world are the people who have overcome challenges and struggles and look for people who are going through the same struggles they once went through because they relate, true. they understand, and they devote and they their life, at least their, their extra time and money to helping them because they know what it feels like. That it's is like, so what? true. That is so true. I'm telling you, I feel like I have to have you on multiple times. I think you just socked it to like my audience with all the nuggets that like I'm always trying to like hit. There were so many good things in this interview. I mean, and that that last, you know, that last tidbit that you gave, I think, you know, I think, too, I want a lot of people in my audience to know because a lot of them are Bali Chuva and a lot of them are saying, you know, I think a lot of them feel like they were set up for failure by Hashem. Hospice Shalom, they should feel this way. We're Bali Chuva. We didn't grow up with all these resources. 
And I'm so glad that you brought out like the difficulties that the fruit from birth have and what the advantage is that they have over the fruit from birth. Um, and it's true. I think that they, they don't realize the potential that they have because they have this hunger, right? It's like, I always say, listen, we need each other. We need the fruit from birth and they need us. We come with the fire and the passion and they come with the how to do it, how to put that fire in. And it, it, I'm telling you, like, there has just been nonstop, like, socket to me goodness in this interview. I really feel like I have to have you back on. It's just been like, I don't even know where to, like, start. My, my tickle's ready to, like, poof, you know? <laughs> so tell us. Where, you know, tell us about your website. What do you've got coming? Are you got any live lectures going on? Let us know where we can find uh, all the information for you. Of course, of course. I will, I will just say one last point, which is that for Bali Shuva, the greatest, there are a lot of people who are Bali Shuva who burn out. And the reason why is because every process has multiple stages. The first stage is inspiration, where you get so excited about this new journey, this new path, the, the possibilities. And then it and comes getting to getting everything actual, just right. Everything. And that's the other thing. They're exactly. so strict. And then it comes to the actual lifestyle, which is the day in and day out, which is the struggle, which is the work ethic, which is actually doing the it. The real grind. Time. And when you can learn to love the process, to remember why you started, and to realize that because it's, come, it's become difficult, that means that you're doing it right. And that if it was easy, everyone would do it. But the fact that you're doing this because you're devoting towards a higher life and remembering that vision is like there's a classic story of a person who was climbing up a mountain and a helicopter saw him climbing and the helicopter you know stopped came by and said like oh i see you're climbing like where are you going and the guy said i'm, I'm climbing up this mountain and the guy in the helicopter said oh i'm actually going there too you want to just hop and i'll take you there and the guy said no i, I don't want to get to the top i want to climb and bali chuva they see people who are it comes easy it comes naturally they've been doing this their whole lives and they just like i'm never going to get there like why even try but if you realize that your mission is not to get there but to go day by day towards there, like anyone who's accomplished anything, it started out with a vision and then you have a combination of tunnel vision and then getting back out, having a Shabbos to reassess. But when you can commit to the process and learn to enjoy the process, Hashem doesn't want you to be there. He wouldn't have put you where you are if he wanted you to be there. You're going on a journey. We're all journeyers and people who are from, from birth, they might, you know, you get zuchos, you get merit for your struggle and what you accomplish based on your bechir, based on your struggle, your free will point. So for them, their struggle isn't doing it. Their struggle is making it real, making it genuine, making it powerful. For you, your struggle is not making it meaningful and powerful. That, that's what you have. Your struggle is doing it, but you're not comparing yourself to them. It's like Einstein says, if you if uh, you know everyone gets judged by how well they can climb a tree, a fish is always going to think he's a failure. Right, right, right. So if you're comparing yourself to someone who has a completely different setup than you, different DNA, different parents, different, everything's different. Why would you get any confidence from where you are if you're a complete failure relative to the standards you're holding yourself to? So self-awareness is really about recognizing what you are supposed to be doing and then getting value and meaning from that. So just for all the Bali Chuba out there, no matter how hard it is, no matter where you are, learn how to enjoy the process, remember your why, and never compare yourself to anyone else because you know more than anyone that everyone has their own story. If you're about Shiva, you you have a story, right? No one makes that type of lifestyle change without really having a story of why they're doing it. Right, if you're doing it. No one has your story. You don't have anyone else's story. Don't compare yourself. In terms of you know where I'm doing and what I'm doing and stuff like that, really everything's on my website. You can really access hundreds of lectures and videos and things like that on my website. You can get my book on my website. I have lots of information, things like that. Um, I do, um, once I release the book, I do travel to lots of different communities. I just finished a book tour in the East Coast. I'm traveling to Los Angeles in a couple months. I have a uh, something, a dinner in Detroit. I have things I'm doing now in Chicago, which is where I live. Um, but please feel free to reach out to me. My email is actually on my website. If you have any questions, if I can help in any way, it's really, it's why I'm here. It's what I, it's what I do with my and life. I and, tell you, it's really good. I think I'm so, I, I gotta tell you, I thank Hashem so much that we were able to connect and get this going. And I'm telling you, this has been a real treat. And I'm hoping that for all of the viewers, this has been a, a great treat to discover, um, to discover you because there's just so much 
sock it to me information um, that you have to bring, which I think is, is desperately needed in this time. People are really struggling with a lot of things, but their identity and their purpose is one of the biggest things that they're struggling with. And it, sh it just seems like it's getting worse. And the only thing that I see coming out from the public is just more of that, um, you know, this is who you are. We accept mm -hmm. you just as you are. And there is no accountability. There's no pushing to become that, that greater you. Um, so again, I think it's just been a, a tremendous zuchus to have you on today. And I, I pray this is not the last time because this was really awesome. Um, but the name of the book is The Journey to mm -hmm. Your Ultimate Self. And I highly recommend getting a copy of it. Like I said, Bizrat Hashem, I'll be linking all of the, uh, you know, to his website. I believe the book is on Amazon too, correct? Correct. The book is basically, I mean, my website has all the links, but it's on Amazon. Amazon, on all the Jewish bookstore websites, um, but the best place is usually Amazon. It's also on Feldheim and Mosaic's websites, um, but also everyone lives in different countries. So if you're in, let's say, Europe, Lehman's um, has the book. Actually, we sold out after just a couple of weeks. So it was amazing. It was, uh, you know, my first book, we sold out. So we just finished the reprint. Uh, Lehman's just got their books in Europe. All the stores in America just got their books. Um, so I really hope you all can get a copy. Uh, it's I highly recommend it. I really do. And especially for those who are on the path of conversion um, or for looking to get into the tour, this is going to be a great start for you. Um, very deep, yet very easy to understand. I think, I mean, again, I just, it's just been a, a tremendous zuchus to have you on and to have this conversation. I think it's a well needed conversation for everything that's going on in this world. I pray that we're going to see a lot more of you, and I pray that we're going to see more of you on this channel as well. Bezrat Hashem, we'll have you back on. Um, but that's it for today, and I hope we'll all be together again soon. Bezrat Hashem.